Celestia is a very basic base layer that's optimized to make it very easy for anyone to deploy their own blockchain on top of it. You have a specialized layer that is only made for one purpose that doesn't have a state machine for like general compute. That makes it easier to scale it up for the demand uh, of like rollups and layer twos. So there's no sort of on-chain smart contract environment for developers to use. There's no layer one applications, it's all in layer two. Because the whole point of this architecture, if you just want to customize one part of your stack, you can just deploy a rollup within minutes and change something about your rollup. You can already launch multiple visa scale networks on top of the Celestia, and even like the whole Solana chain like would fit, so to say, into Celestia even with eight megabyte blocks, right? If, if we get to a gigabyte, that would already serve most use cases. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Ismail Kofi and Mustafa Al Bassam, who are the co founders and uh, you know, CTO, CEO, respectively, of uh, Celestia Labs. This is the second time we're having a mom. Actually, I was listening to the first episode earlier today. Uh, it was exactly four years ago, so it's a lot of has happened since then. I'm excited to to have them on again. But you know, before we talk with them, we'd like to briefly let you know about our sponsors this week. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course One. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like Bitgo, Pantera Capital, and Ledger, trust Course One with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance on networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white label node, restake your assets on Eigenlayer or Symbiotic, or use the SDK for multi chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with Circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis Chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at Gnosis.io. Cool. Thank you so much, uh, Bo, for coming back on again. Yeah, it was it was a long time ago. We had you guys on for the first time. It was still called Lazy Ledger at the time. I think it was just sort of at the beginning. I think rollups. Actually, I remember you you guys already mentioned rollups there, but I think that was something that kind of uh, yeah, yeah, you were also also starting to think about. Uh, so a lot has happened since then, right? You guys have come a long way. But, and then I think in the, I'm sure most listeners or probably pretty much all listeners have heard of Celestia, right? They have like some vague idea, uh, but I think at the same time, it's not always easy to wrap your head around like what Celestia is and what it does. So maybe just to, to kind of introduce people, can you explain like what's the, what was the vision for Celestia and what are you trying to create? Sure. So in a nutshell, Celestia is a very basic base layer that's optimized to make it very easy for anyone to deploy their own blockchain on top of it using things like rollups and layer twos. So, because we obviously we have all these new rollup and layer two technology, but um, no one really tries to build a layer one that is optimized just for layer twos. And you can think of Celestia as basically just layer one that is early optimized and only has layer two. So there's no sort of on-chain smart contract environment for developers to use like all the applications. There's no layer one applications. It's all in layer two. And when we first launched mainnet last year in November, there was this huge need because a lot of people were deploying rollups on Ethereum, but they were extremely expensive to deploy because this because there was an updated availability capacity, which is what rollups need. 
So Celestia, when Celestia launched, it was the first kind of like a specialized data availability layer for rollups. And since then, many rollups, there's been many rollups have started to use Celestia to effectively make the transaction fees a lot cheaper. And so we basically solved this kind of really pressing need in the market at the time that um, no one else was solving at the time, which was cheap, which was scalable and cheap DA for rollups. So, of course, the Ethereum, right, since like years ago, uh, has also chosen to kind of go into the direction of, you know, trying to be this layer one that primarily scales and uh, through layer twos and serves layer twos. Is the, the, what is the biggest benefit of having a layer one that's, you know, specifically focused around like serving layer twos? Is it just around uh, cheaper cost or like what, what other advantages are there? Obviously there's cheaper costs, but you can, you can think of it as like a, a layer that is highly optimized for one use case only. And that itself um, brings like the main benefit, which is like you have a specialized layer that is only made for one purpose that doesn't have a state machine for like general compute. And um, yeah, that, that makes it easier to scale it up for the demand uh, of like rollups and layer twos. I would say. And also like another main, I would say another key benefit is that ver like you have more, like the focus for Celestia is also verifiability. So we, we, we put light clients and end users first, or like users are like key players in the system. So I, I would, I would even go back and say like Celestia is not only like a layer one, which is basic, but which is right. But I would also say that uh, it's an architecture for like, abundant block space where you can like have massive scale and um but this doesn't mean we you just deploy uh, uh on a centralized cloud or something um where you could have like aws which would would give you more scale right but instead you have like verifiability by end users and um by rollups that they can verify the chain even with uh low resource requirements. I think that's also uh, a key benefit. So let's, let us maybe recap briefly. So the way with rollups, right? So with rollups, we generally have a bunch of different roles, right? So we have like a sequencer, we have the data availability, then generally there is some kind of like execution thing or L1, can you explain again, like, you know, how do these different components work together? And what is the architecture? I mean, in a nutshell, a rollup is simply just a blockchain that posts its blocks, not a blockchain. So I think the easiest analogy that I use is a rollup is basically like a virtual blockchain that you deploy on some other blockchain. It's the same way like you might deploy a virtual machine using AWS on on a bigger machine. So there isn't like any specific um, like set of hard components that every rollup needs. You can literally take a tenement chain and purchase blocks on Celestia or some other data layer and it becomes a rollup in theory. So um, there there isn't like some specific set of specific key components. Like every rollup has different components. But of course, in a, a common component that rollup have, rollups have is, sequ is a sequencer. So you might have a um, so like all rollups need a way to sequence transactions. So most commonly, current rollups, they use a centralized sequencer. So this is how like, like Arbitrum 1 or Optimism Mainnet would work, works, for example. It's a single sequencer that takes in transactions from users and generates those rollup blocks and process blocks to the, to the base layer, like Ethereum or Celestia. However, um, the nice thing about rollups is that even if the set, if, even if the sequencer is centralized, in theory, if the rollup is constructed correctly, you don't have to trust that sequencer because the rollup is, is inheriting security from the base layer. Because if the sequencer misbehaves, then because the data is available, you can generate a fraud proof or a zk proof of the mis of the behavior or the misbehavior. And if the uh, and if the sequencer is censoring transactions, then the user can go back to the base layer and force the sequencer to include those transactions by 
posting the transactions directly on the base layer. But not all rollups have sequences. Um, some rollups, there's a category of base rollups, um, rollups called base rollups that don't have any sequences. And they just like rely on the base layer for sequence, sequencing. So like there's no sequence at all, and the user just posts the data to the base layer. So like, there's many there's many different configurations for rollups, and there isn't like necessarily like, all the rollups don't necessarily share the same component or have the same architecture. But that's also that's also the kind of the beauty of rollups and modularity in general, because the whole point of this architecture, where developers use rollups for applications, is that the whole point is that it's extremely customizable. That developers have full stack customizability over how they're deploying applications. And because historically, if you wanted to have full stack customizability over your application, you'd have had to deploy a new layer one using something like the Cosmos SDK or starting from scratch. And that's a lot of overhead. But now, if you just want to customize one part of your stack, you can just deploy a rollup within minutes and change something about your rollup. You can, you can, you can add a new opcode to the EVM. And you can choose to have a centralized sequence so that captures that that captures the MEV and fee revenue rather than leaking leaking into the base layer, for example. And there's so many there's so many customizability options, and I think that's a big reason why developers deploy rollups. So you mentioned the fraud proofs, and at the same time, right? Celestia is this sort of like very minimal layer one, right? Where you uh, where you basically just put the data for uh, for availability. So like, let's say that does happen and you have a rollup that uses Celestia and now the sequencer does something and like, you know, I have a fraud proof. Like how does, like, do you need another chain as well then to function or like how, what would you do with that fraud proof? So if, assuming it's optimistic rollup, if, a, if the sequencer tries to include the invalid transaction on the chain or change the state of that chain of the rollup in an in, invalid way. Like let's say I try to steal people's money, for example. Then because the sequencer is posting those blocks to Celestia, that everyone can see the misbehavior and then they can generate a fraud proof of that misbehavior. And then the, that fraud proof, depending on how the rollup is set up, would be can be, uh, for example, distributed to the nodes of that rollup. And that would allow, or the light clients of that rollup, and that would allow uh, the users of that rollup to reject that block and treat it as invalid. Or in the case of um, in the case of a bridge, for example, you can imagine um, a rollup has a bridge to some other chain. For example, like an an, a piece, an optimism rollup has a bridge to Ethereum. For example, then what would happen is that you would post the fraud proof to the bridge contract, and then because the, the bridge in the in the case of optimistic rollup, the bridge has a seven day uh, challenge period. And so, like every block can be challenged within seven days, and if so, so then someone can post a fraud proof within the seven-day challenge period, and then that would cause that rollup block to be rejected by the bridge, and then they wouldn't be able to steal money out of the bridge. So, in the one example, uh, you basically have okay. If, if all the clients run a light client, then they would just basically recognize okay the thing that is being sent from the sequencer or is is not legitimate so then sort of the blockchain doesn't advance yeah exactly and the bridge is just a it's just like an on-chain like thing yeah and then you would recover from this because like now you still like you you then i guess would want to have some kind of process for maybe you switch out the sequencer or yeah i mean it would depend on um how uh, the sequencing works for the rollup. Like if it's a centralized sequencer, then presumably you would need some way to I mean actually, I mean in theory, you don't have to switch out the sequencer because not like nothing like the sequencer could just continue because the, the sequencer does not have to be trusted. Like even if you can't replace the sequencer, the sequencer, yeah, it it, it, it generated any valid block, but it could still continue generating valid blocks. But uh, obviously um either way, it's not desirable for a rollup to Early with I one sequencer because if that sequencer goes down, then that se then that rollup loses liveness. So I think that rollup still need a way to recover uh, if it, if a sense if the sequencer goes down. And there's kind of like right there's kind of different ways that can be achieved. Like many rollups have a kind of like a, a governance system, and um, where you can kind of like control map parameters of the roll rollup. Or more, more commonly, what Arbitrum does, for example, is that if the sequencer goes down. The, the end users have the ability to uh, post transactions to this on-chain inbox 
which forces which effectively forces the transactions to be execute, executed on an L2, even if the sequencer might be dis- uh, malicious or, or offline. Actually, I'm, I'm glad you bring up this thing, right? Because one of the one of the criticisms that you hear a lot of rollups is actually that it, you know the the centralized sequencer, which is you know still basically pretty much all the rollups, right, have a centralized sequencer. And at the same time, I think many of them are working on some kind of, you know, decentralization of sequencing. Do you think this is essential or do you think like the kind of guarantees that rollups can, uh, can produce are such that like, you know, a decentralized sequencer isn't absolutely necessary or like, how do you kind of view that? So technically, if a rollup is contracted correctly, it's not, it's actually not necessary well, it's not mandatory to centralize the sequencer because the whole point of a rollup in the first place is that you're inheriting security from the base layer, which means you're inheriting um, state validity and censorship resistance to the base layer. So ideally, like if you construct the rollup correctly, you can ha- you can get away with using a centralized sequencer and still have the rollup um, completely censorship resistant because users can can force transactions to be included with an untrained inbox and. Because you have fraud proofs and zk proofs, the sequencer cannot include invalid transactions. In my view, like it's it's perfectly fine, uh, like it's perfectly valid to have the role of the centralized sequencer because the, the, the roll up is still censorship resistant if it's constructed correctly. That's actually like a massive advantage of roll ups. You can get away, like with just you can get away with very little infrastructure while still having full censorship resistant and security. But that being said, uh, uh, there are still advantages to decentralizing the sequencer because um, if you have a single sequencer, the censorship resistance you get guarantees you get are slow in the sense that, for example, um, my understanding with the arbitrary on-chain inbox is that if users use this on-chain inbox to force transaction inclusion, the transaction is only included in 24 hour- after 24 hours. So it's like this, it's like this slow censorship resistance that, that takes 24 hours to get around. So I think there's still advantages to having decentralized sequencers, but the main advantage of that it would give you immediate censorship resistance rather than this kind of like slower form of censorship resistance where you have to wait 24 hours. And that's what some protocols like, for example, Astria do. So Astria, for example, which builds on Celestia is creating um, this shared decentralized sequencer. So it's like, yeah, it's a decentralized sequencer that many rollups can share effectively that posts the data to Celestia. And I think other, other projects like Espresso are also building some things like this. So I recently saw some statistic, you know, that seemed very positive about Celestia is basically that the, the market share, right, in, in this blob space, right, has, has reached something like 40% that is, uh, Celestia is being used for. Can you t- talk a little bit about, like, you know, what are the main... Uh, is it primarily Ethereum layer twos that are using Celestia? And is there anything like what's noteworthy about the, like the current usage pattern that you see of the Celestia chain? So yeah, currently it's uh, the majority of chains deployed on Celestia are actually Ethereum L twos like or, or, or L threes. So like Optimism, Arbitrum chains. That said, I think. It's called Eclipse recently launched, which is like a bit, it's also an Ethereum chain in one sense, but it's also different in the sense that it uses the SVM for execution. So it's more like Solana um, execution, but uh, Ethereum for settlement and Celestia for DA. So I think that also uses up quite a bit of um, Celestia block space. But there are a few sovereign chains like uh, Forma um, and there's more in the pipeline. So there will be more uh, sovereign chains built on Celestia 2, which are not necessarily, there won't be necessarily EVM chains or Ethereum chains. So yeah, maybe we can go into that a little bit, right? Because I I know there's like one project, right, that is a part of the um, kind of Celestia uh, core team. My understanding is Rollkit. And then the, there's this notion of like the sovereign roll-up. Can you tell us a little bit about like, you know, what is a sovereign roll-up and what are the kind of different assumptions that you have in a sovereign roll-up versus one that's non-sovereign? 
like Rollkit, we started Rollkit because effectively no one else was building a general purpose smart contract framework. So at the time, like OP stack didn't exist. You had like, you had Optimism, but there was no OP stack. You had Nit there was, like you didn't have Arbitrum Nitro. There wasn't like no general framework for people just to deploy their own rollup. So you have to use other people, other people's rollups, like Optimism, Arbitrum. But now we do have a lot of frameworks. Now we have OP stack, Nitro, and so on and so forth. And, and that's why we start, that's why we started building Rollkit about three, four years ago. And Rollkit is a sovereign rollup framework. So yeah, what what is a sovereign rollup? So if you look at um, Ethereum's rollup centric roadmap, initially they were originally they were seen as these L2s to extend or scale Ethereum. And now also we have like this concept of network extensions on Solana, where the people are building L2s on Solana and they're calling them network extensions. But Celestia takes a very different philosophy to rollups, like we don't see rollups as just something to scale some other chain or just something to extend from other chains. Like we see rollups as a way to deploy your own chain that's independent in its own right. So like just the same way that you might you might deploy your L1 chain, like why do people like why do people deploy Cosmos chains? People deploy people deploy Cosmos chains because they want to have their own independent chain, not because they're trying to scale Cosmos. It's because like it's not a scaling technology. It's just like they're trying to build a chain and trying to build a good product. So we see rollups as just like a way to deploy your own chain way more easily, not just a way, not just as a way to scale and um, some other chain. So whereas like rollups on Ethereum scale are, are there to scale Ethereum, Celestia does not exist for rollups to scale Celestia. Celestia exists to scale rollups, and so that's where the concept of a sovereign rollup comes comes from. And because rollups on Ethereum, they are kind of like enshrined Ethereum as a settlement layer. They kind of enshrine Ethereum as like, okay, like I have a bridge to Ethereum and that bridge defines my chain, right? But a sovereign rollup is just like, you have a chain as a rollup, but your chain isn't like defined by some other chain execution. It's like its own chain, its own right. And it's sovereign because the 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 uh, upgrade path of the rollup or the use the is users hard forking or users directly choosing which is the correct chain for the rollup similar to like how that how a hard fork on Cosmos or any other L one would work it's not some other Cosmos chain deciding uh, what is the canonical chain it's the users users of that rollup deciding it and so that's why it's called sovereign because it's a rollup that that has sovereignty the same way that a Cosmos chain or any other one has sovereignty. And so when the the, the the upgrade process, so this hard fork upgrade process, like, you know, for example, Cosmos chains, right, generally use some sort of governance thing, right, where you have, like, uh, the the stake and validators especially, you know, they vote on, like, okay, let's, let's make this upgrade, and then the validators coordinate. So in the case of a sovereign rollup, this could basically just be done in the rollup itself, right? That maybe you have like some rollup native tokens and then maybe the, the owners of this token say like, okay, hey, I approve this upgrade. And then it upgrades like the clients that um, that people use to, to verify the state. Is that how it will work? Yeah, kind of. So like w w one of the core values of Celestia is that um, off-chain governance uh, is more important than on-chain token holder governance. Because like, like if you look at what, what the whole point of a blockchain in the first place, the whole point of a blockchain is to create this, is to kind of like a, create a shared computer or a shared environment for people to use such that you don't have to trust any middlemen or you don't have to, you don't have to and that includes, you should not have to trust a majority of token holders. And that's why um, like we're very against token holder governance for upgrades, because to me that defe that defeats the whole point of blockchains. Like if you're if you're saying that um, fifty one percent of the token holders can just rewrite the rules of the chain, then that, then how does that that's not really a blockchain? It's a blockchain, but that defeats the whole point of a blockchain. Like that's just like shareholder governance. Like why don't you just like similar to a normal corporation? But the whole point of a blockchain is that um, it's not just like no single uh, majority of majority 
of token holders should be able to arbitrarily change the rules of the chain. It's like, what if they, what if like 51% of people vote to do something bad or like, I don't know, they were compelled by some court or some government. Like what if, uh, especially the validators, for example. So if you look at like how, for example, um, upgrades work on Bitcoin or Ethereum, there's, they happen on this like very fluid off-chain process. So every time, for example, Ethereum is a good example, right? Um, Ethereum that doesn't have on-chain governance for upgrades. It has this off-chain process where it has EIPs and stuff, um, Ethereum proof of proposals. And then there's kind of like this rough consensus and then there's a hard fork. And if people don't agree with that hard fork, then they can kind of like fork into their own chain. And that's, that's basically what happened with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, right? That was an on-chain governance. So, um, and well, so part of the reason why I think sovereign, roll, sovereign roll-offs are important um, it's because if you look at how current rollups work on Ethereum, for example, the devil is always in detail because uh, the, the 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 upgrade part of the rollup is kind of the most is almost the most important thing from a security perspective, and in many cases it kind of defeats the whole point of the rollup because if you look at the upgrade path of most Ethereum rollups, for example, the upgrade of the rollup is basically decided by some multi-sig or um, some governance process that kind of like almost defeats the point of a roll-up because the whole point of a roll-up is that you're inheriting security from the base layer but then if you're saying some multi-sig can change the entire rules of the roll-up to uh rug you basically then that's not really that, that that kind of is very bad from a security perspective so that's why for celestia for example and um, for, for sovereign roll-ups we kind of see an upgrade path where we're not enshrining the bridge into some committee, and then we, we and then the committee decides what the upgrade should be. Instead, we're saying the bridges are secondary to the roll up, and then if you upgrade that roll up, it's the users of that roll up and, and the nodes of that roll up that decides uh, what the canonical chain is. So the upgrade process would be the same as like any other other one, right? Or like Ethereum or or, or Bitcoin. The, so the developers will propose a new uh, version of the node software, and then people can choose to adopt it or not. And if people don't uh, adopt it, it won't happen. And if it's contentious, then there'll be a fork. And so you have this, you basically have this this right to fork. And the right to fork is kind of like very important to blockchains. First of all, it assumes, right? And, and, and I know this like a big focus for you guys, is that you have these kind of like light clients and that you're not just querying some RPC node for the state of the chain. <laughs> but that you're actually verifying it. I mean, that helps for sure for like users that do not run full nodes, right? But like it is not ne- like it's what Mustafa said about the f- right to fork is like is independent of um, if users are running light nodes or not. It's li- literally the nodes of the network, right? Like that, that can be validated, but also full nodes can, the community as a whole can decide which fork to follow. It's more like a social contract. So that is, is the, yes, the, the light nodes, like the more users run nodes, the more direct impact they can have to choose on which which uh, fork to follow, for instance. But um, it's not it's not a hard requirement that everyone runs a light node for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I can I imagine that to the degree to which this sort of works will depend a lot also on you know, how are these applications created, right? Because in the end, if you have some some app that's being run as a roll-up and, you know, there's like one team that's just building like the application and underneath it uses uh, uses roll-up and, and they just, you know, upgrade the application and everyone sort of automatically upgrades it, then I guess it's going to be pretty hard to coordinate some fork. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's also true, for example, like in Ethereum and Bitcoin, it's the core developer, the core developers have a lot of power over um, kind of like what upgrades get approved. But it's also the case that um, even though they do have a lot of power in deciding what gets get approved, it's also the, the a, big part, a big point of it is that it'll be very difficult for them to propose an extremely contentious upgrade. So if you look at like these, the contentious upgrades on Ethereum, like, Imagine, imagine like um, some. Imagine the core devs thought like increasing the supply by 10x was a good idea, 
uh, that way they can actually be contentious upgrade that let nodes or the, the, the community probably probably would not adopt. So um, it's kind of like more that the ability for nodes to choose which fork they follow basically provides a some level of accountability for the developers because it makes it way less likely for them to um, try to deploy a, a contentious upgrade. And that's that's almost what happened in the DAO in the DAO hack, right? Like that the when Ethereum had a DAO hack, um, the, the the developers fork a chain to undo the hack, you know, and that was extremely contentious. That eventually, it, eventually, it was fine, right? Because eventually, the fork happened, and the ETH ticker is now on that fork that the developer chose. But it was extremely contentious, and it wasn't for free. Like there was, it, it did end up somewhat splitting the Ethereum community. And you had Ethereum Classic, which was big for a while. Now, now it's found dead, but like it wasn't, it wasn't for free. Affected. It basically makes it that there's a, there's a, there's a big social cost to uh, proposing contentious upgrades. Do you think that, in terms of you know creating a sort of decentralized networks, you know that are really like robust, censorship resistant, can't be shut down. You know, sort of realize the ultimate goals uh, that uh, you know. I think Bitcoin and Ethereum and all pursued. Do you think that um, are are there good arguments for building like layer ones versus rollups, or are they basically sort of like equivalent in, or or maybe are there even advantages of rollups because of like this that maybe forks are a bit easier? Or, like, how do you see that? I, I see a lot of advantages for chains to build rollups, and I think the the main advantage is that you inherit, like what what, what Mustafa said in the beginning, is that you inherit the security of an existing layer one. So that means that you don't have to bootstrap your own security in your own validator set. I think that that's the biggest um, advantage in a sense, especially in the bootstrapping phase of the like the early stages of the project. That's I think like the the key advantage. I think. Other than that, um, you don't you have very little like downsides and, and or no downs downsides. Basically, you, it's like um, for especially in the case of a sovereign rollup, it is more or less the same sovereignty uh, that you get as running your own layer one. Like if a community launches a layer one or if a community launches a sovereign rollup, is not that different from the the, the actual like say amount of sovereignty they they get right like they don't have complete control over the consensus or the data like the the data availability part but they can verify the data availability part completely and then over the state machine that's what people usually care most or the communities care most about which which contains the logic uh, over the token and the the more of the social contract of that community um is enshrined in that and then I think that's the more important part uh, for 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 these these community or community computers, so to say, and like there's literally no disadvantage unless you want to, for the sake of itself, deploy a different consensus, right? Like that's that's uh, that's the only reason I can see where it just makes a lot more sense to deploy um, a new layer one instead, right? You want to try out a new consensus algorithm directly and you don't want you want it bootstrapped from scratch like that's the that's the main reason i can see i'm curious a little bit when you uh when you look sort of at at you know this case and to what extent can celestia like satisfy you know all the needs that exist for data availability and i'm especially curious uh, I mean, I know there is this, uh, I think, path to go to one gigabyte blocks. So, like, is that, you know, how much is that? Is that enough for, like, you know, 10,000 roll-ups, all the roll-ups? Or do we need more? I would assume that, like, one gigabyte would be sufficient for all existing roll-ups, for sure. But also um, beyond that, like uh, needs that will arise beyond that. If you, if you, that depends on how you calculate it. But like if you use similar compression techniques as like Vitalik mentioned in 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 his blog post for rollups, I think already with like four or eight megabyte, you can 
um, you can already launch multiple like PayPal or, or like Visa scaled networks on top of Celestia, and even like the whole Solana chain like would fit, uh, so to say, into uh, Celestia even with eight megabyte blocks, right? So and then with like like a gigabyte, so you can have like many of these, right? Like you know, multiple Solanas, multiple Visas, and 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 Visa scale networks and so on and so forth. So um, yes, I think that would, if if we get to a gigabyte, that would already serve um, most use cases. I mean, I, I know I saw some uh, projects that are basically arguing that oh, but there's like some sort of AI use cases or some use cases that are maybe not roll ups that like actually have like much larger data requirements. Like, do you think there are examples like that? Definitely there is. So for example, like we've talked to teams who are doing like AI, AI applications where they want to deploy like entire AI models on chain for each user, like each user might have like a five megabyte AI model that they want to upload a chain. And that requires vast amount of data to put. Uh, and I think to use, to use an analogy is like, it's very similar to, um, the development of like internet bandwidth, where I said in use cases, like streaming. Uh, weren't possible with bail up, for example. Like, there was a lot, there's a lot of like internet use cases that were only possible once you had once you had greater internet speed. And I think we'll see a very similar story with blockchains. Like once we have much greater data throughput, I think it's a matter of induced demand. Like we'll see uh, like use cases unlocked that simply weren't possible in the past. And uh, and I guess connected with that, so. Does latency matter? I mean, currently, like the um, Celestia block time is, you know, like 12 seconds. Is that, is that a limitation or does it cause problems for particular types of use cases? I mean, so the, I mean, the cool thing about Celestia is that it's the only kind of like DA solution with a single slot finality or finality on every block because we use Tendermint. So, for example, like Solana's finality, Solana's finality time. It's four seconds. So like we have the same finality time as Solana. And we want we, we plan to decrease that uh, even further. For example, like there's a um, there's a network upgrade coming to the to to half the finality time to six seconds. And in the future we want to decrease that even further. But um we have to decrease it carefully because if we just decrease it uh like naive naively, then it will make it very expensive for light nodes because light nodes have to download a lot more block headers. So what we're trying to do is trying to decrease it, but um, having this idea of micro blocks. So like we have like very frequent micro blocks, but we have uh, less frequent blocks and light clients only have to download blocks, not the micro blocks. So it doesn't affect how much data they have to download. But um, I think Celestia is a unique position by having this kind of like this fast finality because it makes the user experience a lot better, especially if you're trying to do cross rollup transactions. Like if you have two rollups on Celestia and you want to like bridge between them, especially the ZK rollups, if you do it on Ethereum, for example, you have to wait 12 minutes. 12 minutes is the minimum, is the lowest possible timer. Assuming that you're posting ZK proofs every block. And 12 minutes is the lowest possible time because Ethereum's finality time is 12 minutes. But because Celestia's finality time is in seconds, that means you can have a very, you can have a much faster user uh, bridging experience between these problems. Yeah, I mean, I think that actually is a, is a great segue into a topic. Yeah, uh, we wanted to bring up as well. I think like Ismaili also like talked about this a little bit. So yeah, let's talk about, I guess a bunch of things like bridging, interoperability, and, and I'm curious where the role is of, of ZK. I think you mentioned it sometimes. I saw it mentioned in the, you know, Celestia roadmap. Uh, so yeah, I mean, maybe just st start here where you think makes most sense. Sure. So like one of the core values of Celestia is that we want to have a very minimal execution environment and because we want to minimize on-chain state. Because one of the things that limit option scalability is state bloat. So if you look at Ethereum, like one of the bottlenecks for Ethereum is the sheer amount of state there is that you have to store in RAM to run a node. So 
And that's why we've made, that's why there's a concrete design decision that we don't want to have a smart contract environment last year. We're only focusing on data availability and scaling that. But the problem with that is that like if a role up wanted to use a tier token in a trust minimized or native way, they would have to reuse third party solutions or third party bridges. So for, like, for example, they would have to transfer that tier token to over IBC to some other chain, and then the other chain would have to bridge to them first. So right now there isn't really like a native way to bridge assets like tier from the Celestia base layer to these rollups. They have to use some third party, third party bridge basically. But in order, so in order to make that possible, you basically need some kind of like um, expressive way to have programs on the base layer. And the, na the naive way to do that would be to basically have a smart contract environment on the base layer. But it turns out that you don't have to do that. You can just add um, support ZK proofs to the base layer. And then what happens is that instead of programs being directly executed on the base layer, the programs are executed off chain and then proven on the base layer. And that's basically how ZK rollups work. So then if you have a ZK rollup, that means you can now bridge directly to Zestia using by verifying ZK proofs directly on the base layer. This is kind of really powerful because it's basically like the Celestia will be the first base layer to have this thing called um, fun functional escape velocity, which means that you can extend the functionality of the base layer arbitrarily, but without us needing to support on-chain smart contracts. We just have to support ZK proofs. And basically, the end game of this effectively that Celestia becomes a uh, base layer that only does DA and verifies proofs, and that's it. And I think that should, that's, and that's also kind of like the end game for Ethereum, right? But Ethereum is stuck with this on-chain smart contract environment that they've kind of inherited and then has become, has, has become a kind of uh, a baggage that limits its scalability. So, uh, and, and the kind of cool thing is that, um, so these roll-ups will be, will be able to have the, to bridge directly to the year. And, we call this lazy bridging because it's, it's lazy in three ways. It's like it's lazy for the user because the idea is to create an end user experience where everything feels like one chain. So if you're interacting with multiple rollups, ideally we should have a wallet where interacting with all of those different rollups should feel like you're interacting with one chain. And that's possible with things like chain abstraction, for example, but it's also uniquely enabled by the fact that Celestia has an immediate finality on every block. So because we have like a few, our finality is a few seconds instead of 12 minutes, these actions that users can take, they, they will feel like they're happening on one chain. So let's say you have TR on rollup A, you can go and mint an NFC using that TR on rollup B without having to bridge it first, right? And that's already possible, for example, with um, four bar chain using Astria. So, so it's like it allows the users to be lazy. But it also allows the developer to be lazy because the developer can have access to all kinds of assets within um, not just the Celestia system, but outside of the Celestia system because Celestia supports IBC. And the, the kind of cool thing about that is that means rollups of Celestia have, have a native way to access assets outside of the ecosystem um, without relying on these kind of non-neutral third-party bridges. So if you look at like, for example, like the bridge between Ethereum and Solana, it relies on the wormhole, right? So it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel credibly native, right? It feels like you don't have to trust some third party to use that bridge. But Celestia, like for us, Celestia will have assets outside of the Celestia system because Celestia has easy support IBC. So for example, um, you can go and mint USDC on Noble, and then you can bridge that USDC to Celestia and then bridge that USDC to the rollups. The swallow ups will have a will have native access to USDC, for example, for example, and not just USDC, but any other assets on any other IBC support chain. And so that kind of like makes Celestia very uniquely suited to being this um, base layer that allows users or um, developers to have access to assets uh, as this kind of like a bridging hub. And finally, it's also lazy from a from a base layer perspective. Because it keeps, it's still keeping the base layer lazy because the la base layer is only responsible for verifying proofs. Like it doesn't actually execute 
the transactions are going to show up. It's just verifying proofs. Are right, we not adding smart contracts to the base layer? It's almost a year, right, that Celestia launched. And now I think yesterday, right, the first uh, upgrade uh, with Lemongrass came through. What were the biggest changes in that upgrade? I mean, the, the biggest changes were also bridging related ones like or, or interoperability related. One was adding interchain the support for interchain accounts. And the other was um, the um, packet forwarding middleware such that you can like, basically you can forward IBC packages through Celestia or, or through, uh, like, the, yeah, basically that. There was two, these two features mainly were like requested by many liquid staking provider teams, but also from teams that want to uh, build better UX for bridging on top of Celestia. So that, I think that was the, that the are the biggest changes, um, but there were also many, many smaller improvements. Um, I think one of them, which is a, like a precursor for um, fee burning is, is adding a min, min gas price, right? Like, which is encode, like hard coded into the, um, into the software instead of like, uh, having validators only choosing the their own local gas price. Actually, I think that would be interesting to to talk a little bit about here is the economics. I mean, I, I mean, one thing that's been interesting, right, to see on Ethereum is that uh, you know Ethereum used to make a lot of money from the uh, fees, right, that were paid on the layer one, and now they've had this kind of strategy to scale. Uh, using rollups and it has led to a dramatic decrease in revenue, right, for the Ethereum layer one. I mean, I've also seen, uh, you know, numbers for Celestia. I don't know what the numbers are uh, exactly right now, but, you know, basically that like, you know, to the, the amount of fees that are being paid for the ability on Celestia is still like very, very low. Uh, how do you see how do you see that kind of developing, and how, what are your expectations about the the kind of economic uh, dynamics we're going to see here? Yeah, I mean it's kind of interesting because um, like every few years, like someone comes up with some different value accrual story for why L one should accrue value. Like I swear, like I, like a few years ago, it was like the main value accrual story for ETH. Was like it was used as a monetary asset for as and DeFi collateral for DeFi ecosystem. Now people are fixating on the revenue. So it's like every few like it's like every few years people have the, uh, this opinion this opinion about how L1 token should accrue value. Ultimately, uh, like revenue fee revenue on all L1s is, is is relatively relatively low, like even on Solana and Bitcoin, for example. But the way that we look at it is kind of like it's kind of twofold. So, firstly, effectively, um, we believe that it's possible to for the base layer to be sustainable using economy of scale. So, historically, the, the way that L ones have accrued value by fees is by uh, kind of like this artificial scarcity. But so, like Ethereum used to have a lot of fees because it had very limited block space. And people were paying twenty dollars transaction fees, or hundred dollars transaction fees per transaction, to get access to liquidity, and like that, that's just fundamentally not sustainable. Like uh, even, even like maybe you'll maybe that's that's successful in the short term, but someone that that, that then liquidity is just going to move to some other chain with the transaction fees are that expensive. So fundamentally, we believe like the only way to make a a chain sustainable is by offering like by selling many transactions at scale to millions or billions of users so for example if you even with eight megabytes let alone one gigabyte of workspace if each user is paying a tenth of a cent per transaction then that can still equate to hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of protocol revenue depending if it's a, what kind of roll-up it is whether it's a zk or a mystic roll-up and fundamentally and um, I think that's the, I think fundamentally that's the kind of like only way to uh, scale revenue if if that's what if the revenue is the important part of the story. But ultimately, I think that's a that's that's a theory of value accrual as it's been proven. 
Like there's no proven value accrual me mechanism for for L1 tokens. As I said, it's, it's like it's still very early, and um, like no L1 really has that many fees. Even like Solana, for example, c compared to this valuation, like Ethereum had fee had a lot of fees for a few years until it had rollups. So there's no kind of like proven theory of that yet. But if, but the other kind of like value accrual mechanism for, or the other use case for the Celestia token is that. It can be used as a token to bootstrap new rollups. So just like Ethereum can be used to uh, pay for gas for rollups or pay for um, a cloud for DeFi or as a bond for sequencers. Similarly, uh, Tia can be used to effectively as a way to bootstrap new rollups, whether that rollup needs a gas token or that rollup needs some way to bond some stake to operate the sequencer set. And that's already what's happening today, for example, with the former chain and Astria, uh, and Astria the chains on Astria use TF to pay for gas for the, for, for the rollups. And also, for example, you can buy NFTs on former using TF. And we expect this, that kind of usage to continue, especially as we roll out daisy bridging, that makes it much more native and much more frictionless for developers to gain access to TF for the rollup and other assets via Celestia. So is like accessing Celestia with lazy bridging or TR going to be easier than uh, other assets that are not native to Celestia? So, no, I mean, it should, it, the, the beauty of it is that it will be as easy to access other assets as well, as long as they come to IBC. Because like you can bridge a USDC from Liverpool to Celestia and then you can go, out, go and access that for your rollup. Because it's, it's all just IBC, right? Like the way that the lazy bridging will also you be using IBC. It's just like a different type of IBC client that verifies DK proofs instead of validating signatures. Um, Ismail, you mentioned before ICA or like interchain accounts being added. What are the kind of ways you hope to see it being used? L literally whatever you can do with it. Um, so, so it's not like the this upgrade is basically like a precursor to to lazy bridging, right? Like lazy bridging requires ZK accounts. There's still like ongoing research work um, or like very concrete research work is very applied, but like it's it's it still requires some development work there um, until ZK accounts and ZK RBC are ready. But like we don't want to block the ecosystem, so to say. Um, on on using existing interop solutions, and um, that's why PFM and ICA interchain accounts are uh, already in the upgrade. But I mean, I think given that the teams um, that requested these features are mostly liquid staking uh, providers, I would assume at least that these are the major use cases, like for ICA at least for interchain accounts at least. Um, but there's no there's no opinion f from like i don't i don't want to say like this is what i what it should be used for because like literally whatever it can be used for it should be used for um that said i think for the uh for interchain accounts i think the set of messages like sdk messages um are somewhat uh, uh, limited. For instance, you cannot do um, out -Z, at least that's uh, what the CIP proposed, right? Like you cannot use out -Z messages via interchain accounts. So there is some opinion, it's like the minimum set of things um, are allowed such that it is useful. Um, so it, 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 when I said that whatever can be built with, it's already a bit limited, but only a very little amount Maybe zooming out a little bit, uh, I think in general, it seems like in the crypto space, uh, there is a lot of kind of concern that, you know, there's been all this investment in infrastructure, scalability, interoperability, and at the same time, you know, we don't see a lot of uh, user growth and adoption. Is that something you guys worry about? Like where and where do you guys think we are in this sort of crypto adoption cycle? Yeah, I mean that's the 
is this is this actual question right like wh- where are the apps um uh, but i do think i do think like we are seeing kind of like cooler and cooler apps coming online i think that the original application of use case of, of like crypto is ultimately payments so i think um that's kind of like the biggest problem it's like, well, like how, how can we actually make payments crypto payments mainstream because to me that's that should be a clear application but with rollups, like we are seeing um like cool experiments with with payments that are possible without rollups. So for example, there's a project called Pay, like P A Y Y, that is a rollup that uses Celestial Code A. That is kind of like a, pri- a privacy preserving way to transfer stable coins and um pay- new payments. And so I just think we kind of like need, need a lot more experiments in payments to see kind of like which payment application can actually achieve this, this breakout option. And so far it's been like, it's been USDC on Tron. USDC on Tron is used a lot. So for, for some reason. USDT. Yeah, USDT, sorry. But uh, I think we're also seeing like, outside of payments, we're seeing a lot of other cool um, applications. Like on-chain gaming is getting a lot more advanced. Uh, like, you know, like a few years ago, you just be like, on-chain gaming was very basic. It was like, Many trade like NFC based on chain gaming, but now we're kind of like seeing people develop much more advanced on chain games. Um, this cool project called B3, which is uh, kind of like a game studio, a new, a new game studio that is launching Web3 games. I mean, also ultimately, I think we'll see what kind of use cases are unlocked by um, like Raider and Raider Data Report. As I mentioned, I, like I mentioned, for example, there's a lot of AI use cases that people are building that involve users uploading AI models directly on chain. And especially use cases like ZK machine learning as well. I don't think like it should be one or the other. Like there might be a lot of emphasis on infrastructure, but I think that's a necessity to actually have um, cool applications. They like like Mustafa mentioned, for instance, these AI models. If no one was building something like Celestia, for instance, they, it wouldn't be possible. So I, yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that we will see more and more um, cool applications, but also I'm, I'm also not, I also don't think we're done with the infrastructure yet, right? Like it's, it's not, we're not fully like, all oh, the infrastructure is, doesn't need to change anymore. There still needs to go a lot of like engineering effort uh, to actually scale the infrastructure that we have. And then also to the upper layers a bit, right? Like there's, there's infrastructure that makes things possible from like a, like a, base layer perspective, but like for end users, I think there's a lot of infrastructure that is still missing um, to make their user experience as smooth as possible. And then I think once that is all done, um, well, we'll never be fully done. It's like, it's, it's, it's tech, it's engineering, so it's never fully done. But like once that improved significantly, we will see more and more applications. I do agree with Mustafa that like payments like even just payments would be just payments would be like the killer applications where um, I'm also very, I'm also excited about um, the, all these gaming rollups coming, um, uh, uh, like coming to existence more and more. So I'm, I'm, I don't have time to play them myself, you. but I always believe that like games and um, um, and blockchains or crypto or, um, are like a perfect fit. So I think like AI, gaming, and payments, um, we'll see more of that and also applications that we cannot foresee yet. And maybe, maybe Ismail, so we, we talked about a few things, right? We talked about some consensus improvements and uh, the CK accounts. What, what, are some, what are the main other technical things that are, you know, like on the roadmap for the next two years? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the main thing is like abundant block space, right? And that, uh, basically has two components to it. One is on the consensus layer, like the block producing layer. Um, so, so basically the tandem network, like peer to peer network and like the mempool, like there's a lot of optimizations that will happen there, um, to make it way more efficient than it currently is and optimize it for throughput. And similarly, the sampling and the um, the A network side needs to improve a lot. 
And besides like this goal, like this North Star of like one gigabyte blocks, it's abundant block space. We want the block space to be verifiable by anyone and we want it to be frictionless. So I think like um, for the verifiability, basically the idea is that you can like run a node, like a Celestia Knight node on every device. Like you can everywhere, wherever you are, whatever device you have, you can like verify the, the, the correctness of, of, of Celestia, so to say. One, one of the main features that is required for that is like a, a proper, um, mainly Rust implementation because it's easier to, to have it compiled into Wasm that exists today already. You can already go on Lumina RS, right, and, and run a Celestial Light node. What I find even cooler is that this Celestial Light node is now integrated into Selenium, which is like a, a block explorer. So what you, what you ideally want is actually that you instead of using like uh, Kepler's infrastructure for RPC to submit transactions, you'd actually have these light clients running in your browser in your wallet, essentially, and you communicate directly with them. So you can like even have less trust assumptions for end users um, and having them, instead of using some like, um, like centralized API and RPC, you'd have them, oh, I run this thing, I've verified it. Like it's, it's not something they have to do consciously, but like, it is something that we um, are pushing forward such that the like end user gets the same experience that they have today or even better, but at the same time are actually running their own node. So um, that's like the, the verifiability part. And then we want the block space to be frictionless. Um, that, that obviously includes like you UX, like developer UX improvements or developer experience improvements. Like um, API improvements for the for the for the rollup developers, but it also includes things that like Mustafa mentioned um, with like zk accounts and 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 um, what we call lazy bridging essentially, um, such that you can like more easily stream like any asset in and out uh, through Celestia. And like I think the the mental model here is that while you interact with um, uh, an ecosystem of very heterogeneous chains on top of Celestia, like EVM chains, Solana, the, like SVM chains, execution environments that don't even exist yet, and rocket chains, and and so on and so forth. Like while you interact with in this, like while you move in that ecosystem, it should feel like you're on one chain, right? Like it, 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 that's the idea is like as if you were like on Ethereum or on Solana, like uh, one layer one, and you would interact like with these smart contracts. It should be at least as good as this, and um, yeah, I think that's the like high level summary of the of the roadmap. Cool. Well, thanks so much, guys, for coming on. I think this was super great to to catch up on Celestia, and yeah, it feels like it's it's uh, it's really sort of getting to the place where we're gonna hopefully start seeing this. Uh, the consequences, right, of these uh, abundant cheap high performing block space and uh you know i really hope that mustafa is going to be right that there's all of this demand and use cases that are just sort of like waiting to happen when you know when we have that infrastructure when we have that like cheap fast uh scalable interoperable block space so i'm super excited to see what's going to happen in the next year and two years for celestia and in the ecosystem likewise <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks.